So welcome uh, everyone to episode 43. Um, you'll notice this episode's a bit different in that we are not live, we are recording this. Uh, and the reason we're doing so is because uh, the day that this is going to go out, I'm going to be in Paris at the Ryder Cup. So when we were deciding what we were going to do and work around, we decided as, as it was golf that was, was preventing us from going live. And the first time in, in 43 weeks, we, or, or the second time I should we have been able to that we make topic about golf so we, we've sort of tentatively entitled it podiatry and golf and we were we had a chat and we did want to call it podiatry um no no sorry but, uh what do we want to call it craig golf and foot orthoses and yeah. golf didn't we yeah well like, um, it's, you want to title episodes or anything you do on the web <coughs> in, in such a way that it can be found in the search engine so i thought um golf and foot orthotics would be better because if anyone's searching for golf and foot orthotics, they might find our video. And the, the other option was who could call it podiatry and foot orthotics. Um, so I actually did a bit of digging around and I'll just share, and this is the keyword tool I use. And it turns out that no one actually searches for golf and foot orthotics. And <laughs> when I, when I typed in golf and podiatry, which I'll do now, um, Turns out nobody searches for golf and podiatry either. Um, so it's going to take a few moments. So the yeah the um, some there are people search for golf coast podiatry, which I assume is a clinic on the Gulf Coast. Um, so at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what we call this episode. We can call it foot orthotics and golf or podiatry. And no. golf. It's not going to make any damn difference in the search engines. What, what strikes me is this is either an incredibly good idea because there's a niche here that no one's done and we're about to, we're about to break into it or it's a terrible idea and people aren't searching for it for a reason. And I guess we'll find out when we, when we look at the stats. Um, no, I mean, no, at the end of the day, there will, there will be people searching for it, but according to this keyword tool that I use, the numbers are so low, it's not actually worth targeting because you know, <laughs> the numbers just aren't worth it. Yeah. The, the non-golf fans out there will enjoy that stat, I'm sure. Um, we are, what are we going to do? So what I did, because we don't, because we normally have the live audience to bounce off and help guide the discussion, and we knew that we weren't going to have that. Um, I put a little message out on my Instagram, uh, as it's a little thing on Instagram stories where you can ask questions, and I sort of said, we're doing this topic, uh, we're doing this uh, subject, does anyone have any questions? So the few questions that came in um, are the ones that I'm going to sort of go through, and I've just thrown together, I grabbed a few slides from an old presentation I'd done, I threw in a, a few more, and I'm just going to um, run through that initially, just to cover all the questions that came in beforehand, then you and I can sort of talk out... Um, anything that comes from that if we wish and uh, then we can can see where we go um apologies in advance i'm a bit nasal i've woken up this morning um with a terrible bout of man flu so oh that's that's I, serious i'm sure i'll make it i'm sure i'll make it so um <clears throat> let me just share my screen so hopefully you can see that craig is that all okay um is that okay craig can you see the screen yeah uh, thumbs up can you see it yeah no yep yep sorry yeah, okay, sorry. thought i'd frozen for a minute as my internet uh, has a tendency to do so um yeah just just a few slides to run through the the the, the questions that came in uh, really to give this you know i guess what we're, what, what we're trying to say is what are our aims of what are we going to try and carver um the big ones that came in uh, beforehand were well, from people that perhaps don't treat golfers and, and would like to or every now and then they see one and they're they're nervous because they don't see them regularly enough. So the questions and the aims of, of this of this one are going to be, um, you know, what sort of questions do we need to ask a golfer in the history taking? Uh, what are the common problems we see in golfers? Um, should I be concerned that I don't know anything about the golf swing and golf biomechanics? You know, um, a reasonable comment is that if you're going to see if you're going to treat sports men or women you should probably have an understanding of their sport so that's a big worry for for quite a few people interestingly um and just a bit about again foot orthoses when do we intervene um and the kind of the the, the topic surrounding that um the other thing that came up was the difference between uh, how the feet behave because i think the one thing that everyone's aware of is is um even if you don't know golf, you know that the left and right feet during the swing are going to behave differently. So this is a video of, um, it depends who you ask when you ask someone who the greatest golfer uh, on the planet is in history. But as I've got the microphone right now, it's my opinion that matters. And in my opinion, it's Tiger Woods. So this is him. Um, 
the golfers amongst you will be elevating at the uh, at the divot he's taking. I mean, I don't know if you play golf at all, Craig, but trust me when I say that that is delicious that divot. But the non golfers, the point we're trying to make with this slide is really the the feet. This isn't a full swing for Tiger here. This is a this is a sort of half swing. It's a little it's a little wedge into the green. So it's it's nice and slow. So you can just see the real difference between the front foot and the back foot. And for for the non the non golfers, the, your your front foot is your your lead foot. So Tiger is a right handed golfer. So his front foot is his left foot. Um, and as we're looking at him now, his left foot is, is on our right, if that makes sense. So you're going to see the front foot and the back foot behave differently during golf. And I think this is something that worries people because their lack of understanding of that is what, what makes them concerned. They, they can't treat golfers. And what I want to try and do today is put forward a case, in, in my opinion, that that doesn't matter too much. And that actually, I don't think you need to worry too much about understanding this to, to treat golfers um and, and i'll come on to to explain a bit more um about why another question that came in was what about the difference in quality of golfers so we may be treating the the club uh, the club member the high handicapper the 28 32 handicapper we may be treating the tour pro uh, and, and everyone in between and they are of course different i don't know if you're aware craig of why this guy would have his his uh, shorts around his ankles it's a, it's anyone who plays golf will be yeah, I haven't seen that one before. <laughs> yes, anyone who plays golf will know why this guy's why this chap's got his trousers on his ankles. They, we've all been there. Um, it's, it's a golf thing, but it, obviously it doesn't happen in the professional circuit. But the differences between the two, uh, other than the quality of strike, the consistency of swing, are down at foot level are fairly significant. The reaction forces generated, the, the velocities of you know of movement, the joint moments, the club head velocity are all significantly greater. Um, in the professional compared to the amateur. And even as you go through the handicaps, you'll see, you'll see differences. And, and this is important because you need to know who's in front of you. And we'll, that will come onto that with the history taking. <coughs> Excuse me. So really, really rudimentary cursory overview of the golf swing here. Most literature will suggest that ground reaction force uh, is around about 1.5 body weight. And I think your dog's trying to get in again, Craig. 1.5 times body weight and, um, it's reasonable to say from the data as well that this will be the ground, ground reaction forces will be double at the front foot. So remember, that's the left foot for a right handed golfer and vice versa for a left handed golfer. Uh, double at the front foot than they will at the back foot. And the joint moments and accelerations during the swing are, are, are you know, as you can imagine, quite significant. And when we compare that to what the other thing we do when we're on the course, in between the shots we hit, we obviously walk. Um, ground reaction force is more like, as we all know, one times body weight. And it's reasonable to say that uh, the, vo the velocity of movement, the accelerations and you know, the joint moments are going to be much, much lower when you compare the walk to the swing. And all other things being equal, if you think about how asymmetrical the feet are during the swing, it's reasonable to say they're going to be much more symmetrical during the walk. And this is the first point I really want to make sure people are comfortable with in that I believe if you can, if you, if you're happy to see someone who walks, if you're happy to assess, treat, prescribe foot orthoses for someone who is a walker, then in my opinion, you can do so for a golfer. And I want to throw the, the numbers into this and, um, and sort of explain why. These are stats that I took from the European tour a couple of years ago. They're the, they're the mean stats. So they're, they're going to, they're going to vary depending on who you, uh, you know, what level you're at, but, I just want to throw them out there, a bit, bit of a sort of back of the cereal box calculation. But on the tour, this particular year, the average strokes per round was 72. So that is 72 times that the player is striking the ball. However, it's really only around 30, 29 of, uh, putts uh, of those per round that you can pretty much exclude. Because as you know, I'm sure, Craig, a, a putt is just standing still on two feet and, and moving your arms. There's really no, no consideration as far as the goal swing is concerned there. So, um, you remove 29 off of 72 and what you're left with per round for the, for the average tour pro uh, in this particular year was 43 golf swings. So they are striking the ball 43 times per round. Now the dura average duration of a golf swing varies. Um, but if you take the most sort of beautifully tempoed and labored swings like Ernie Els, Luke Donald, Fred couples to name but three, um, they're really They've begun and they've ended within two seconds. So these guys are really swinging the club at the ball 
for 86 seconds per round, so under one and a half minutes. If we're really generous and we give them two, two practice swings per shot as well, and we add those on, we're still looking at four and a half minutes of swinging motion. Um, and the average round on the European tour takes five hours. So what you've essentially got is a five hour round where you're swinging for five minutes, absolute maximum. The other four hours, 55 minutes, you are walking or standing. And the average course length on, on the uh, tour is, is um, just over 7,000 yards. And I don't know if people, how people like to do these. So if you want to change that into our old money, you're looking at four miles or 6.5 kilometers. So you're, you're really looking at golf, a game of golf, a competitive round of golf, being a six and a half kilometer walk, which takes five hours. And in that time, you swing at the club for five minutes, five minutes tops. Arguably the most important five minutes as far as that golf is concerned. Um, that's how they make their money and how they win their titles. But from our, from our perspective, if we're looking at optimizing the foot level environment, whatever optimizing may mean, and we'll come on to that, we need to ask ourselves, would it be appropriate to optimize the, the foot level environment, the footwear, the foot orthoses, et cetera, for the swing? You know, the swing where, where clearly the left and right would have very different someone who's a golfer or are we treating someone who's a walker and i think that's a really interesting discussion i'm not saying um uh i'm not saying that, that my opinion here is the only opinion but certainly this is one that i i hold and when we look at the sort of problems we see in golfers um we will notice we will ask during the history as we'll come on to say when does it bother you does it bother you during the swing does it bother you during the walk uh, quite a lot of the time we need to ask them now of course does it bother you in the gym because a lot of them now are doing a lot of strength conditioning running so actually we may not be even if a golfer walks in it might not be that you need to view them or treat them like a golfer and i think that's a, a really important thing to to bear in mind so when it comes to the history um and i should probably quickly give a, a, a tip of the cap to one of the, the clinic i work at because this is these are photos from one of the clinics i work at and i should probably use them without saying that um, these are some of the questions I think we should ask every single golfer we see. We should document these. And we're not just asking for the sake of asking. We, every single question here has hopefully will now become clear, has, has, a, has a reason. You should always ask someone if they're right-handed or left-handed. And I'm sure if you see footballers, you'd ask them the same about what their dominant foot was. But you really need to know whether they're right or left-handed to know what their dominant foot is, or what their front foot is, I should say. Their front and their back foot. And we are going to see patterns emerge, certainly. Over the years, we've noticed you see a lot more perineal tendinopathy on the front foot. Uh, you see a lot more sort of medial column, hallux first MTPJ pathology on the back foot. And if you think about the way the weight shifts during the golf swing, I think that makes reasonable sense. So knowing what handed they are, I think, is, 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 is pretty crucial. Um, Ask them what their handicap is. At this point, people are worried that they, 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 they feel like they're being nosy. I promise you golfers love nothing more than talking about golf. Anyone that's met me will, will, uh, will testify to that. So they won't, they won't be too alarmed by all these questions. And the reason you're, not, you're asking them their handicap is because the, the 28, 30, 32 handicapper is a different beast to the, to the scratch golfer or, or the tour pro. Sure. Now, Ian, I'm sure in the comments, someone's going to be asking what your handicap is. <laughs> yeah 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 i'm pleased to say i currently don't have one um because <laughs> since my children were born i uh rescinded my membership and i was a nomad but i am a i'm a viciously average um but enthusiastic golfer who normally gets takes about 18 on every course he plays and i rarely play to 18 so yeah let's get that but let's get that elephant out of the room um so yeah we've got to ask them what their their handicap is because like i say it, it will it will have an influence on the way they play the game. Your, your mind should be thinking about the forces that are being generated at foot level. But also, if you're going to intervene, intervening at the, 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 the club hacker like myself versus the tour pro, you're going you're gonna to meet different barriers when you intervene. So you need to know what kind of golfer I think you're, you're, you're dealing with. I'll also I'll always ask them where, where their membership is, where they play their golf. Um, not because I'm just I'm, I'm angling for an invite to have a little knock with them, although that is always welcome. It's, it's more because 
we need to have an appreciation of the length of their course. We need to have an appreciation of whether it's a very flat course or a very hilly course, particularly if an Achilles tendinotti on a very hilly course, clearly there's, there's considerations there. We need to know whether it's, um, you know, what, what, what the terrain is like. It, how wet does it get? You know, how well does it hold or not hold water in the winter? These things are, are hugely important as well. They are going to influence. And um, off the back of that, do you carry your bag or do you use a trolley? And if you use a trolley, is it a push trolley? Or is it a pull trolley? Is it an electric trolley? Um, there's, there's data that was published that showed if you carry your golf bag, your, your risk of musculoskeletal complaints increases. It won't surprise you to hear that the, the biggest increase is actually the back, but also the ankles. You're more likely to develop ankle problems if you carry your bag. And if you're pulling your trolley behind you, um, that's going to have uh, sort of influences on, on, on things as well. So majority of club golfers are using trolleys nowadays and most of them push. So it's not a big a biggie, but we'll always ask that as well. If they're carrying their bag and they've got an ankle problem, step one, tell them to get a trolley. No, no question. Obviously, tour pros have got their caddies. Um, and finally, how much they practice. And this will feed into where they, where they play because some courses have practice grounds and some don't. It will feed into their handicap, how seriously they take it. Now, the reason we need to know how much they practice is because of what I've just said about the ratio between walking and swinging during playing. If all they're doing is playing 18 holes once a week, then those stats, you can treat them like a walker. If they are spending two or three hours on the range, just hitting ball after ball after ball, then you're dealing with a slightly different beast. And I think you probably can entertain the idea of slightly different devices for the driving range in their shoes uh, and compared to different devices when they're actually playing. We've definitely done that for players before as well. Sort of it, if you know they're going to be standing and swinging for an hour or two, uh, as, as tour pros at least will do that every day, they might want this pair of shoes, this pair of devices, but during competitive games, they might want, you might want a different pair as well. Um, so I think how much they practice, how seriously they take this, 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 this sport, and it is a sport for those who don't think it is, um, it is important as well, um, particularly in the context, I think, of the, of the presenting pathology as well. So last couple of slides, and then uh, we'll have a bit more of a chat, a bit more of a casual chat. When we give golfers orthoses, it feeds into all the things we've said already, which is uh, how accepting are they going to be of those? And, and certainly I've noticed patterns that the level they play at will, will, will dictate how that discussion goes down. There's a couple of boxes that we want to tick when we give orthoses to, to golfers. And in fact, I think it's fair to say every single one of us probably wants to tick both these boxes, regardless of who we give orthoses to, regardless of the sport. They should be beneficial. So they should have some, you know, positive clinical outcome or, you know, um, a positive response from the person wearing them. And at the same time, we'd like them to obviously concurrently not cause a new issue. I think that's fairly, fairly obvious and fairly standard. Um, that's just as important in, in non-professional golfers or, or people as it is, as it is professional. But of course, um, the professional sometimes make you feel like it's more important. It, clear, it clearly isn't. The two things that, the golfer will really want the boxes the golfer will want ticks. And again, I think the first one, it being comfortable, is, is again a box that most people, golfer or otherwise, at whatever level, will want ticked. But the no interference with swing is really, really key. The better the golfer, the lower the handicap, the tour pro, the, the, the club pro, you know, when you get down that end, you are going to meet incredible resistance if when they put them in their shoes, they, they feel that it will interfere with their normal swing. At a high handicap, you, you know, you're so inconsistent and, and unrepeatable with your swing, you just won't tell the, tell the difference, to be honest. But it's nice to have something to blame, if, I think, if I'm being truthful. But um, down at the low end, the, the low handicap is the scratch golf, is the pros. Um, you'll see as soon as you put them in their shoes, even, even if there's not a golf club around, the first thing they'll do, you know, if you, if you give a device to someone in clinic, a runner, the first thing they do when they put them in their shoes is they get up and they walk up and down your room, don't they? They walk up and down uh, your, your cons consultation room. If you give them to a golfer, they stand up and they sway. They, they shift their weight. They essentially start taking little practice swings. And I promise you, the, the, the second they feel, if they make a judgment there and then they don't like them, they're, they're not going to wear them. They're going to be in the bin. So I think we need to make something that's immediately comfortable and immediately doesn't give the golfer the, the real or perceived notion that their swing will be interfered with. And sometimes you're going to have to compromise on what the prescription you write, the, the recommendations you make, what you put in the shoe to achieve those two things. Um, 
And again, the lower the handicap, the, the, the more you're probably going to have to compromise in those regards. That can sometimes be a challenge. Coming on to the fun stuff, and I know that once these slides, once these, these, the, the, boring, the boring monotony of me going through these slides is out of the way, um, Craig will want to get stuck into this because this is his favorite um, topic, <laughs> as you know, pseudo, pseudoscience. Um, the problem we have with golf, I think like many, it's not the only sport or, or even activity, is that you have an awful lot of people who are very average at it. And I, I'm very much in that group myself. And you ultimately have this group of people that are willing to do anything to be better. And we, we you know, whether it's, it's you know, in this case, the promise of hitting it further, straighter, harder you know um all of those things a golfer's like yes please yes please yes please quick fix 30 pounds in my shoes and i'm gonna hit the g-. clearly uh, clearly nonsense clearly not 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 really data driven but golfers will will lap it up um, and i think anywhere where there's a group of people that want a quick fix whether it be the golf or whether it be the diet industry or whatever it may be you're, you're going to have this aperture for pseudoscience to, to seep in these are just two of Many, many, many that I know you and I have seen over over the years, Craig. So we'll talk a bit more about those in a second. When you do put, when you go into say Google Scholar and you pop in golf insoles, I did this with insoles, orthoses, orthotics. Did it with several, and it was all the same really. It's really interesting to note that the first, that, well, the, the first couple of pages are patents. You, you know, you don't get to actual. There's more. There's a lot more patents out there than there is research. There's a lot more people saying we're going to make a shoe that does X, a shoe that does Y, um, and and a lot of them are. You know, um, if you look at their dates, 1979, and that one's only. You know, I was I was one when that one was done. 1987, you know, 1993. None of these have really, um, have really taken the world by storm since then. So uh, clearly, it's it's it, there's a market for 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 making these kind of promises. When we look at the actual research, doesn't, it's pleasing to note that it doesn't take that long because there really isn't that much. There, there, there truly isn't that much. And I had another quick search again just, just, um, just this evening after dinner um, just to check I hadn't missed any. And I, I'm sure if I have, you'll, you'll pick me up on it, Craig. But these are the, 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 big, the big three. This was a, a paper done back in 97. Um, and let's just focus on the conclusions for now. Improved balance and proprioception. So uh, I, I guess, you know, uh, both of those you might, if you immediately take them at face value, you, you might be happy with. This one, three years later in 2000, uh, CHV is club head velocity. So it's how fast the, the club head is traveling when it hits the ball. So it's going to hugely impact on your, on your distance. Um, club head velocity increased by five miles an hour, which is equivalent to another 15 yards. So that's the real money, the money shot. That's the stuff that golfers are going to, rub their hands together and say say take my money and this one um all of the devices reduced fatigue which again you could argue um you know i know it's it's not quite as demanding as, as 80 minutes of rugby but anyone that's that's played on a really hot day and they've carried their bag you, your legs can sometimes get tired and maybe maybe that would be considered a, a benefit as well but i think the thing to note with these even though they were published over a four-year period and it's pretty obvious once you highlight it is that they're all from the same author, which is fine. You know, we get that a lot in certain areas. But if you look at the cohort and you look at the, the sort of characteristics of the cohort, they're all on, on subjects of, of all on cohorts of nine people who had handicaps of, of less than 10. So straight away, we need to say this is a this, this probably isn't applicable to high handicappers because we know high and low handicappers are different. Are we comfortable extrapolating the findings from nine people out to the entire population? And I don't know about you, Craig. Um, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I hugely suspect that this was just one group. This wasn't three different groups of nine people. So 27 people total. This was one group of nine people that they collected a load of data for and got several different papers out of it. Do you think that's a reasonable assumption? I would make that assumption. I mean, at the end of the yeah, day, there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with only nine subjects. You, you look at, you look at other things before you decide nine's too small. Of course. Um, yeah, one of those. Uh, I'm glad you said that because one of those other things, if you look into the into the titles, uh, is the effects of orthoses, the effects of orthoses, the effects of on nine holes of simulated golf. These are. This is not. You know, what we're basically saying here is these are the papers that, that are most commonly cited when it comes to reduced fatigue, increased distance. When it comes to and within the study, no one played 18 holes and no one played outdoors. Which, you know, so we've got low handicappers playing nine holes, simulated, and now 
we're telling every golfer on the planet, go outside A18 on undulating surfaces and you're going to get an extra 15 yards. And, and clearly we, we should be reasonably uncomfortable with that. Um, there's really only two other papers that I'm aware of. And this one is, um, was around 2007, I think. Yep, 2007. And um, this looked at, uh, this was an RCT looking at off-the-shelf devices in amateur golfers. So amateur, that they were, had a handicap of over 15. So we're getting more into the, 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 the probably the population mean, because it was, I suspect, I don't know what it is, but I suspect it's, it's closer to 18 than it is to, to nine. And there were 27 people in this study. And the conclusion here was that, that orthosis reduced fatigue general you know fatigue which is good the only other study that and that's the last slide i've got so i'll just um end my share the only other study that i'm aware of that uh that i've read and i don't pretend to understand so i haven't included it in those slides is it was published earlier this year and i'm sure you you remember it because it was on podiatry arena that i saw it it was the study that showed the inserts improved the symmetry of the of the wrists oh, do you remember yeah, that do you yeah. remember that study that was yeah um and i'll, I'll be honest they were wearing like a little measurable device. I don't know enough about um, that to, to make massive comment, but it it sounds odd to me, that one. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I mean, that. From memory, they did show it did change the symmetry, but I, I don't know which symmetry is good or bad when it comes to golf swing. <laughs> hey, I, I'm an I'm I'm 18 handicapper at best. You, you know, I don't know either. But yeah, the, the point being, the jury, the evidence is very, very sketchy when it comes to orthoses in golf with regard to the, the, the promises and the claims of improved distance, improved oh. accuracy, which should make sense to us. That, yeah, clearly, that, that doesn't sound right from the off. I think what we do is we, the fact that we don't have a lot of data of orthoses in golfers doesn't matter because we have an awful lot of data of orthoses in runners and walkers and like i say for the majority of people we treat who present and, and identify as a golfer we're not treating them as a golfer we're treating them as a walker or a runner so we we, we lean on, on on that evidence that's my take anyway i don't know if you agree or disagree Craig. oh yeah i mean the, the, i presume the bulk of foot orthoses used in people with golf are because of heel pain or some other pathology and yeah of course you of course it's, you use them of course you do it um, it's just the, the, the pseudoscience, the nonsense that goes around is whether it can actually improve your performance. And like in preparation for this a couple of days ago, I did, I did some Googling as well and came across a number. A number. <coughs> when you put up a, your, your screenshots had two companies, you know, promoting and arguing for golf sh orthotics. I mean, there's a lot more out there. Um, again, no evidence, lots and lots of testimonials from golf pros. Um, you know, I, I, I use the, this particular brand of insert or whatever it was and, you know, my handicap went down. I see it in my clients, um, <laughs> you know, no, nothing that we're not, have not seen before, but at the, the end of the day, the, the data, the evidence, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, golf is not immune to the pseudoscience that goes on everywhere else. Um, and athletes, I think it, I think it makes sense to be comfortable at foot level. And, you know, we know that that's an emerging field in orthoses, in running footwear. You know, com comfort is probably a good thing. Um, and I think then that feeds into the footwear. So golf footwear itself is, 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 is a bit of a minefield because um, it's a bit like, you know, you know the running the running footwear sort of industry where you've got this this many shoes to choose from and, and different makes, models, manufacturers, different technologies. Well, you've got just as many, if not more, in, in the in the golf world. But the interesting thing is you're not delineating them into categories like you are the running the running shoes. Really that that you're really choosing them based on comfort. So it's the level of cushioning they have and, and also excuse me, their their width. Their width is a key thing. You often the most common question I get asked about golf shoes is um by by, by colleagues and golfers alike is what what's the best, what's the widest golf shoe out there? Um and again, you know, um it's like it's it's a difficult question to answer. You need to look at the foot usually as well, but there's you know you don't want to you gravitate people towards certain brands and away from certain others. But the challenge when you're seeing professionals is of course that they are sponsored. Um, we certainly, I don't know if it's appropriate to say this, but I'm going to, we certainly saw a couple of, a couple of guys who were sponsored by the same, uh, brand, um, and had the same pathology and we sort of, it could have just been coincidence of course, but it was exactly the same shoe, exactly the same pathology in two, two very different styles of golfer from a swing perspective. Um, and a bit like when you look at the football stud plate 
imagine you had a footballer who came with sesamoiditis. You know, you, you, you first thing you do is often look at the stud plate and look at the stud placement. Golf shoes are, are not dissimilar. And, um, uh, you know, they had this particular brand had a, 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 a sort of one of these, um, hybrid kind of spikes, you know, the, uh, molded spikes in exactly the place where the, the pathology was. And, and the question then becomes, well, do we bring this up with the manufacturer? And the answer is, of course, no, you just, uh, entertain the idea of taking the shoe to the grinder, <laughs> grinding away that bit. And then, and then you're good to go. So you do, you get different challenges at the top end of pros and the bottom end of club golfers. And, um, yeah. I say majority of the time, I think you need to ask an awful lot of questions about their golf because it really does help you, you decide kind of what's going on here. And, and, and a lot of the time when you ask those questions, you may, you may realize that this is someone who plays golf, but actually they got this injury doing something else. This, is not a, this isn't a golf thing. It's, you know, once something hurts, uh, it's going to hurt when you're playing golf because you're on your feet for four or five hours. But it doesn't mean it's a golf-related problem. It doesn't mean you need to start worrying about the mechanics of the golf swing. And I think that's the, the, the biggest take-home for me. Yeah, uh, no, I think the, the mechanics the of the golf swing, like I can remember some really quite old advice that was quite commonly given quite a few years ago, is that you, uh, if you're going to use rigid orthotics in a golfer, don't use a heel post. Right. Um, because the heel post will interfere with the swing. Now, I'm not so sure that actually stacks up because I can still you know, move medial lateral in a, on top of an orthotic with a rigid heel post. But that was, yeah. but that that's pretty much what you were saying that the pro golfers are going to want to know is it going to interfere with that medial lateral movement? Yeah, um, and the other well, the other thing to know is, and this is this is pertinent given the direction that you and I have been taking some of these podcasts and um, all these pod chats and and our thinking with regards to the the old school very structuralist way of thinking versus the more you know embracing more of the biopsychosocial sort of aspects um not that it's a false dichotomy but you know what i mean and, and golfers are completely entrenched within alignment and kinematics from from as soon as they start showing promise they've got people analyzing they've got their, their their swings being videoed they've got these lovely bits of kit most of them have them in their houses in their gardens track man and all these kind of stuff they they're, they're data driven everything they do you know it looks like they're walking around hitting a ball but there's just so much depth to it more than that everything you know they know every single distance with every single club with every single version of a swing they can do with that club and they're incredibly kinematic in their thinking if you think about breaking down the golf swing you'll see them in their practice swings sort of what they call sequencing so really so they come into us with this mindset and they've probably got this opinion they may have even been told it by another health professionals um the orthoses are to realign them, which kind of makes sense to them because that's the world they live in. And then that terrifies them because they're like, well, I don't want my foot to be braced. And, and as you and I know, whether there's an extrinsic post or not, that foot's not being, not being braced. Um, we, we did entertain the idea of, of having different shell stiffnesses of the front foot and the back foot. Because obviously, you know, as a right-handed golfer, you're shifting your weight to your left. Yeah. You really want that right device in, in its medial arch to be reasonably compliant. Yeah. Um, and you might want a big lateral heel cup on, on, the, on the outside of the left device. But the trade-off of doing that and then, then walking down the fairway yeah. didn't, feel, didn't, didn't feel right to me. Yeah, no, um, you, that, that's, that's probably going to create more problems because of the... the yeah. four or five hours of walking you know it's, yeah. and we, we have given people devices like that for their practice hours for their range time when they're standing on you know when they're just standing on the range for a couple of hours but we say this is this is your practice pair and it's not the pair to be played in and and, and, yeah. and vice versa there's talking about pseudoscience in golf i mean there's also um lots of other people the, the i know you're a big fan of um applied kinesiology I know oh you've yeah always, you've always been a big fan of this and uh, and you know golfers have belief golfers have beliefs um, it's an incredibly demanding game from a psychological perspective and i was talking to a golf pro about this recently um a club pro and he was basically saying you know if you play football or tennis you, you you're, you're reacting so you really you know the ball comes and, and you just have to go through a filtering process and, and make a decision and you really don't have much time to make the decision with golf this little white ball sits there and, and will remain completely stationary newton's first law i guess until you make a decision about what uh, you need to make a decision about what you're going to do to it and you've hit the ball 350 400 yards that's an awful long time to walk up to it it's too much time to think it's way too much time to think so they, they play the game sort of as they say you know in the, between their, the six inches between their ears and um that feeds into their beliefs away from the course as well so if they truly believe in pseudoscience 
in applied kinesiology, in homeopathy, well, whatever it may be. If they truly believe that something they do, cupping crystals, is going to help them, you know, um, well, when this goes live, I'll be, at, I'll be at the Ryder Cup. I guarantee, I don't know for sure, but I guarantee there'll be someone at the Ryder Cup who does something at what we, that we would consider a bit crazy and a bit funky the hour before they tee off at the Ryder Cup on, on Friday. Because they have, the, you know, they're humans. Sure. They're, 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 they have beliefs. Interesting. In, in preparation for this, I actually went hunting for an article that was in <coughs> illustrated a while ago. And it was something, the title was, you know, why are athletes so gullible? Unfortunately, <laughs> the article's offline and now it doesn't exist anymore, but it was in Sports Illustrated. And it really did, it talks a lot about golf from that perspective. Yeah. About why, why do they believe in all these sorts of things? Um, yeah. And that athletic market is, you know, the thing about the power bracelets, you know, to, yeah. <laughs> to improve your golf swing. You know, um, yeah. if they believe, they believe. Um, and, and that's not just golf. Football is a, you know, yeah. they call it superstition, don't they? But, but yeah. actually they do something once and they have a good game and, and they, you know, that post uh, hoc ergo proctor hoc fallacy. And then suddenly for the whole career, they put their, their left shoe on before they're right or, or, you know, whatever it may be. You see some golfers, they'll, um, they'll all have a, a really, really structured pre-shot routine it would be identical okay. every single shot, but they'll, they'll even go as far as when they take their glove off to part, it will go into the same, you know, some of them will go, a lot will go back pocket, some will go front pocket, you know, where they put their scorecard, where they put, everything is, is the same. Yeah. There's, it's, there's no, nothing left to chance. And, and I think whether you're a, a club golfer or not, you just, you just sort of think, oh, okay, I, it, it worked once. I'll try it again. And um, what we need to do as the professionals as always is, is, uh, tactfully sort of explain to them that, um, that perhaps the, their beliefs are misplaced. But that also feeds into why, especially a lot of those foot orthotic for golf websites are so reliant on testimonials. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and it actually reminded me of, of that study a year or two ago. Now it was on runners, <laughs> but it was a small qualitative study on runners. And one of the conclusions was that runners were more trusting of anecdotes and testimonials from fellow runners than they were of health professionals. And, you know, there's no reason why golfers wouldn't be in the, in the same boat. They, they want to believe that stuff and they, and they do. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. No, absolutely. So they can be challenging, but like any, I think any, like any sport, whether they're professional or otherwise, whether you're talking golf, football, running, ultimately someone comes to you. Um, I think one of the, one of my favorite quotes from, a couple of episodes ago, 41 with, uh, with Ben, Ben Cormack. And it's, it's resonated with me since I can't stop thinking about it. It was that, that pain isn't the thing that drives people to come and see us. Do you remember him saying this? He's like yeah. being yeah. in pain is not what drives people to come and see us. People can live, can and do live with pain. It's, it's the point where pain starts interfering with quality of life and preventing you doing what you want to do. That's what drives people to come and see us. And, and I think, um, regardless of the sport you've got someone coming in whether they want to play their monthly medal on Saturday or whether they're playing the Ryder Cup you know tomorrow and and they want to play their game and they are concerned that that their their, their sensitivity what they're currently experiencing is going to interfere with that and we need to uh, in, you know uh, apply all of our skills that we've been talking about from all previous weeks the history taking are utterly key as it is always but i think the the psychosocial aspect and then of course the mechanical aspect but but interestingly i i found myself talking about mechanics further down the list as as the years go on yeah, um, no, is, uh, I, i've got this sort of cognitive dissonance going on within me i don't know if you feel the same as well you know um I'm trying to enjoy it and trying to just go with it. But uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting journey that we find ourselves on. And these pod chats are certainly uh, exaggerating that. So um, there wasn't really any other questions that came in um, that I don't think we've touched on. I don't know, how long have we been going? Because uh, we're not live. I can't just see over, Just over half an hour. But just, just going okay. back to your thesis and the pseudoscience, actually one, one, <coughs> one sort of, say, use of photothesis that... Yeah, you know, again, not backed by evidence, but I could certainly live with is the prevention of fatigue. You know, that, that mm. you, you've got a, you've got four to five hours, uh, okay, mostly on a soft surface, but I could, I could see photothesis perhaps playing a role in lessening fatigue and perhaps enhancing somewhat how they feel towards the end of the day on the golf, mm. on the golf course rather. Yeah, I could, I could, I can live with those sorts of claims, but it's, it's just some of the other claims about the velocity of the golf head 
um, you know, put these yeah. in your shoes, your golf head will go faster. You'll, you'll uh, do better. Um, yeah. I think, I think I'd like to think we all agree. Anyone listening would agree that's nonsense. It's not only backed by, it's not only lacking in evidence, but it's as we, as we always say, it's lacking in biological plausibility, plausibility. theoretical, <laughs> theoretical coherence. It's lacking in everything. Whereas when you look at, the person who has an ankle equinus and obviously there, there's a certain amount of knee flexion and ankle flexion required to gain to the, the, right. the stance of a golf swing, a couple of heel raises for, you know, I mean, we've got no evidence for these things, but, but I think, I think you can justify them. I think you can ra- rationalize them um, yeah. for sure. Right. Um, we see, um, we see an awful lot of first MTP pathology on the back foot. So it's that, it's that foot that as they kind of, make contact with the ball when they come through they'll often really supinate their front foot and they'll often turn their body facing their target and they'll go up into loaded flexion um, basically the back foot gets into a similar position to that that it would be in a in a press up if that makes sense um, and if you've got an irritable first mtpj on the right side and you're a right-handed golfer you get to the top of your backswing you can't feel this thing yet but i've had golfers say to me at the top of their backswing they start their downswing they're already thinking about it. When's, when's this little sharp pain going to come? And it, it completely destroys um, the way they play. And they're, they're a real challenge um, because that is, whether it's a swing problem or not, we don't know, but it certainly interferes with the swing. And that's a big deal. Um, they're not great candidates for, uh, for surgery. Um, and Oops, sorry, and you've just frozen there. Um... Now, for, for those of you who are watching the, watching us live, you might have noticed this is actually pre-recorded. Ian's um, has to be away at the Ryder Cup this week. So if you've got any comments or questions, um, by all means, post them live and we will um, try and get back to them at a subsequent date. So so Ian's just came back now. So I was just explaining, Ian, that you, you just right. posted for a moment. And I was just explaining how this is being pre-recorded. And if anyone has comments, questions, post them and, and we will respond. I suppose it's appropriate time now that I should share my golf experience. Uh, my golf experience probably consists of this um, with my daughters. I'll have to confess, I've never actually ever played a round of golf in my life. Uh, that looks amazing there, though. Where's that? Is that in Melbourne? I'm not sure where that is. I just found a picture to sort of, you know, but it's crazy pretty, golf. Pretty, pretty, pretty impressive sort of golf. Of course. <laughs> um, yeah. but I, love, I love a bit of crazy golf. Yeah. Um, but the other thing would just, again, you know, in preparation for a lot of these episodes, you know, we, we do a little bit of hunting around and I actually found this book on Amazon, which I thought was interesting. It's called golfers and skiers, a golfer's guide to skiing and a skier's guide to golfing. And it's supposed <laughs> to be a humorous enlightening and unique coffee book to look at the 40 similarities between golf and skiing. So I, I have no idea if this book's any good or not, but I just, I thought it was very funny Let's just, let me just. I'm definitely going to buy it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just scrolling. I'm just trying to find the index. Table of contents, gallery. Spe- uh, oh, okay. So there's nothing, you know, nothing there. But yeah, I just thought that, well, that was quite funny. So, so maybe yeah. this is good I night. mean, yeah, like people are watching. Do, if you do have any comments on anything we've said, disagreements, questions, by the way, this is live and we're really going to uh, respond to them in time. And, I'll be, in, I'll be in Paris and I'll be sitting in my hotel and I'll probably, it will be a bit weird because when you put this out live on, on Thursday at eight o'clock, I'll probably watch it myself. So if there are comments, I can, I, I, I can chip in an answer if, if, if I'm around. So yeah, I think that's, uh, we should, we should wrap up there. Do you think? Oh, so that's, that's a good note to finish. So thanks everyone for watching. Uh, sorry, this has been pre-recorded. You know, we will it'll be up on YouTube pretty soon. The podcast will be there and Um, So thanks, Ian, and we will see you next week.